All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are now live on what is another beginning of a quest to go ahead and conquer every single crypto gaming node in existence. But today I have a special guest. It's not just any AMA. We have the hottest node sell right now, Aether's co-founder here, ready to absolutely slay it with me and educate the masses on Deepin. Dan, how are you doing? Very good. Uh, super excited to be here. Um, thank you for hosting this while you're abroad at GDC. It's all good. Oh, it's all good. It's fun. Full yeah, market vibes. No rest, right? No rest. No rest. We're live at GDC. What about Mary? No, 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 no. It is Aether time. Like, this came out of nowhere for me. Personally, I'm a crypto gaming guy. I love playing games. I'm typically speaking not too big on the infra side. I've heard Alex Becker, Elio Trades, all these like creators always talk about like focus on the infra, focus on the infra. And I'm like, I like playing video games. Like I, I'm a dude that was challenger in league and I was looking forward to this kind of stuff. But then I I, I kind of thought to myself, what about the back end? <laughs> like what about, what about the other parts of the system that make it work in the first place? And so there's this like huge forefront of technology. And apparently like, like Danny, you're at the forefront of this. Like what's going on? Like what is Aether and like, why do they call it deep in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So look, basically at our core, we're utilizing GPU compute to solve for real-time latency-sensitive use cases, uh, namely gaming and AI use cases, right? Um, and it's funny that you you mentioned you're a League fan. Uh, so I, I spent the bulk of my career at Riot. Um, oh, yeah. So I have... Uh, I was very early on. I was head of international publishing management, global expansion, infrastructure. And then after the Tencent acquisition, I was a COO and uh, head of operations for Riot China. So unfortunately, I, I never made it any further than uh, Gold One. I was a one trick Leona Your pony. Stuck, but it was Super Server, right? Yeah, no, it's definitely not. Not super <laughs> was, server. Okay, you were just yeah. hard to sign. Got it, got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, building, just, you're busy building, busy building. Hey, it's okay. I was building, plus I was support. How do you carry a support, right? Um, I, I could name a couple ways, but continue. Okay, okay, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, so so what we build in, inherently is a solution around um, the biggest hurdles for centralized infrastructure. Because centralized infrastructure, especially for like, say cloud gaming, right? What they do is they build giant data centers in one location for economies of scale, right? Like say one giant data center in Portland to service all of the Western uh, US, right? But what happens? Well, in like cloud gaming, that means the service sucks because it means you're really far from the data center. Like if you're, if you're in Texas and you're trying to play from the IDC in Portland, like you're going to have some- You have a million ping. Yeah, exactly. And so- like centralized infrastructure just inherently doesn't work because they're incentivized to build everything in one location. And then actually it becomes more expensive in certain scenarios because the bandwidth cost is higher because you have to push that data further and further. Plus the actual performance and the experience sucks because you know, you're really far away. But in like Web3 in a distributed hardware network, uh, DPIN, right? Decentralized physical infrastructure network, um, you have tons and tons of little nodes that pop up. So if you think of like, like a map and you have more little dots all spread around, then the average distance between those nodes gets shorter and shorter, which means the performance goes up, right? You have less uh, milliseconds of ping plus less cost. Really? You're pushing that data less distance, right? Um, so you get better performance, better experience, and it's lower cost. It's magic, basically. Now, that's just like on a pure infrastructure basis. When you add the fact that you can uh, utilize a token incentive to kind of hack this like chicken and egg problem that you have with infrastructure, then basically it, it, it solves all the major pain points associated with like Web2 cloud infra. Yeah, so from my perspective, listen, I'm a pea brain. A lot of us here are pea brains. We like to oversimplify things. I, I saw Helium, and when they started with that whole 5G hotspot network, it's yeah. a lot bigger than it was before. That thing was, like, dead for the longest of time. Now, all of a sudden, people are using it. And it, and it really taught me that it's kind of important to put things all over the place. Because, originally speaking, people, you've got your little T-Mobile satellite towers. The second you get away from them, it's screwed. But, like, on a Helium phone, you're perfectly fine. So, would the future be, like, we've got these Aether nodes, 
Um, they're going ahead and giving this computing power to whatever specific task, which we'll get into. And that just helps do the process better because it's kind of more spread out than just yes. like one centralized place on like one centralized uh, location. Like yeah. I've always had the biggest ping issues in the world with League. I remember when I had bad internet, I used to have like 120 ping. And then, you know, as I got closer and closer and closer to Chicago, uh, that ping number got a little bit better for me. Of course, Koreans, they've got it way better than all of us. But is that kind of the idea of like reducing ping across the board by just like throwing it all over the place and then incentivizing yeah. like humans to provide some of that power? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's pretty interesting you say that because this is the whole like foundation of like yeah. edge compute, right? So you want to push it to the edges so like you get as much coverage. Um, and so, yes, kind of like Helium and yeah, maybe it was dead for a while, but that's just because infrastructure takes a long time. A lot. Right? It's expensive to build out to get coverage. And once you have coverage, you have to get adoption. And this is back to like the two sided marketplace that I was talking about is like, okay, even if you had demand, who's going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars all around the world building out like micro pockets of compute without incentive, right? Like who's going to do that? No I one. Mean, even, <laughs> no one's no, doing that. If you look at like, uh, I mean, for super famous failed cloud gaming projects like Google Stadia, Right, Google. Oh yeah, that went nowhere. Right, like as big as they are, what they've got to invest hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars into IDCs, data centers, spinning up hardware, spinning up uh, compute, in hopes of adoption, in hopes of people using their service. But that, even in the biggest scale, it just doesn't work. Why? Because well, you can't de-risk it. Now, on the other hand, if you're like a gaming studio. If you're epic and you're like, hmm, I want to provide cloud service for Fortnite for all my players, but somebody doesn't have coverage in, I don't know, California or know, Arizona or something, like you can't be like, cool, I'll deploy it only here and then fuck over those players or screw over those players, right? Like, and so it's most kind of, of been these, the case. Yeah, right. Like, so what happens is they're like, okay, well, then we'll just have to wait until infrastructure builds out, right? So what happens is like you have this chicken and the egg. Who's going to go first? Are you going to invest in infrastructure and build it out first and hope that they come? Or are you going to onboard this, this demand and then hope that infrastructure builds to meet your demand? Well, in Web3, there's this, this magical thing called a token. And where, pumponomics, of course. Yes, right? And you can incentivize folks to be the first actor, right? So we de-risk it for compute and we say, hey, here's compensation, here's a base minimum return for onboarding compute into our network. It's like being a waiter at a restaurant. Even if you have no customers and no tip, you get some base minimum wage salary, right? That's essentially what we're offering to compute, to de-risk, to bring on all their you know, GP resources into our network. And then we say, cool, when you actually uh, price your uh, service fee competitively and folks use your service, then you get compensated even more tokens. So what happens is then like compute, they tend to push down their service fee lower and lower and lower so that studios can onboard more and more demand. And this is really cool virtuous cycle because like the more demand you have on board, the more utilization and ROI like the compute providers get back. The more demand and ROI and utilization, the lower they can charge their service fee because they're already making money, right? So it keeps going up and up and up. Yeah, I, I think what you're saying, the YouTube audience is liking. The numbers are going up. Everybody's starting to chat. They're like, I like the computing numbers. You're talking about the nodes. Okay, fine. Well, let's start talking about the nodes. We got the boring stuff out of the way. We understand the computing power. So, so we've got Reb over here and they're from Washington, right? ROI. Yeah, everybody's just like Roy boys. So, um, so we've got peeps from Washington over here. And so let's say, you know, Reb over here wants to go ahead and run one of these little Aether nodes. Can you explain like, why do we care about Aether nodes? Why yeah. is this node sale necessary? Yeah, super, super necessary. Cause look in our ecosystem, not everyone can be a compute provider, right? Like right. an NVIDIA H100 is like $300,000 minimum. And you need to have like, be an NCP provider for NVIDIA and you have to have like a T4 data center connection and it's crazy. So it's going to be much, somewhat central. Yeah. Like crazy, crazy high price, very, very hard to deploy somewhat centralized. So the only way 
to make it work in Web3 so that there's no collusion, right? Because remember, we don't own this hardware. Somebody's contributing the compute to our network. So how do we enforce SLAs? How do we enforce a quality of service on them? Well, to make it decentralized and to make it trustless, we need this role that we call a checker. You can think of it as an inspector, a validator, somebody that is checking on all the different GPUs to making sure that, okay, it's up, it's running, it has capacity, certain liveliness, certain ping, certain you know uh, uh, resolution. So like, let's say you committed to 4K resolution, someone's gotta make sure you're not streaming in 1080p, right? So who's gonna do that? It's these checker nodes. They're constantly checking on the quality of service that these GPUs are providing for the service being paid for by some of the largest gaming studios in the world, some of the largest telcos in the world. So we're the supervisors is what you're saying. Basically the inspectors, the supervisor of the ecosystem, making sure shit is done at a very high quality bar. Okay. And, and why do we have to sell these spots? Yeah. So uh, basically we want not, so versus like the uh, containers where you have to stake, we don't think anyone needs to stake to participate in this ecosystem because technically if you don't participate and you don't do your checking or do your inspection, there's no loss, right? Like there's no user being like, oh, I got disconnected from my game because the GPU went out. Yeah. But you get rewarded for it if you participate. So in order to create a little bit of a barrier of entry so that everyone has some skin in the game to be an inspector, right? To make sure that they're actually doing their job. Um, we put a little bit of a price tag in there so that you have to buy this license so that we understand people that are buying this license aren't just going to sit on it, right? They're going to buy the license, yeah. you'll run it to actually contribute in the ecosystem. But we set it so that like essentially folks through the public sale can buy at the lowest, lowest, lowest tiers, like a 70, 80% discount to our series A round for those that are willing to participate in the ecosystem and contribute to the network. Has that already been announced, the Series A? Uh, we're, we're fielding the last few term sheets from investors. Okay, okay, fair, fair, fair. Uh, yeah. All right, so we're getting a 70% discount on what? Like tier one, tier five, tier seven? Yeah, so from the public sale, anyone can get in from tier yeah. one. It'll be a little tough. We know there's quite a They're bit gonna of They're going to use bots. We put like a bunch of anti-botting solutions in place. Okay, it's still going to be tough. You can't you can't block a hundred percent of them, right? Um, but in order to help that, we actually also limited every wallet can only buy five nodes in the first and earliest tiers, and then it slightly goes up. That way, there's a fair of a chance for everyone participating to snag some like tier one nodes. Which basically means if you're willing to contribute, that's like the holy grail. It's like the golden ticket at the Willy Wonka factory. Like, <laughs> yes, those yes. tier ones are crazy. So, um, okay, so we got into this for the people that just got into the stream. Like, what is the pricing structure? Are, are we like Gala? Are we like Miria? Are we like Zai? Are we trying our own thing? Like, are, what what's going on with that? Yeah, so it 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 starts at five hundred bucks, and uh, if they use your code. They get of jam, of course. Yeah, of course. Um, they get a ten percent rebate, right? Yeah. Um, so basically, five hundred. They get a ten percent rebate that brings it down to four fifty, right? So it starts at four fifty, and then after we sell, I think five thousand licenses, uh, it goes up to the next tier, which is like five hundred and seventy-five bucks. Five thousand. Yeah, five thousand licenses. Then okay. it goes up. And then basically, if we, you know, again, they get the 10% rebate off of that. And every so, like, I think it's 5,000, then 4,500, then 4,000, then 3,500 nodes that are sold, licenses, the price goes up slightly. And as the price goes up, again, the number of nodes that we sell in each tier goes down. We have a max cap of 100,000 nodes. So we'll, we, we won't allow any more licenses to be minted than 100,000 nodes. But what we've allocated is 15% of our total token supply to the checkers. So if there's only one checker operating the ecosystem, they get 15% of our tokens. But you know, obviously, if there's a there hundred, be a lot of them. Yeah. If there's a hundred thousand checkers, then the, it's split between a hundred thousand checkers who are actively doing work. Which means, if you actually contribute and you run and you uh, actually you know uh, load the program, uh, run the program 
you're going to get more tokens than someone who's like maybe Wi-Fi is down all the time or forgets to run the software or whatever. Basically, you earn when you're actually contributing into the ecosystem. Yeah, I, I mean, we, we do have like a few like node as a service providers, right? They just run it for you. Yes, yes. So we're working with uh, actually one of our largest investors, Animoca. They're going to so be Animoca is doing them. Yep, uh, Animoca, Luga nodes, Node Ops, Builder, uh, who's another VC investor of ours. Basically, some of the most reputable names and largest, like one of the largest validator networks uh, in Web three. They're all node as a service operators for us. You can literally just click delegate, uh, enter their their wallet address, and yeah. delegate to them. Um, they all have different service fees and business models. We we don't kind of control that. They're in the middle of proposing that uh, to us, um, and then we'll just kind of embed that directly into the checker software, and then you guys just choose whoever you guys want to use. Or we have some folks that like to run these things themselves. They don't want to split it with anybody. So then you can actually just deploy it on the cloud. Like go to Amazon, deploy a VP virtual private uh, server. You can run like a hundred nodes all in one instance. Too complicated for most people, including <laughs> myself. Click, yeah, click and delegate. I feel like it's a lot of just education with this kind of stuff. It's so many new things happening in crypto at the same time. So, so for U.S. citizens, like, can they get into this node sale? So, yeah, unfortunately, due to securities law, we yeah. can't support U.S. citizens. Um, so we do KYC when folks claim the token. We can't support U.S. citizens. However, we support all IDs around the world, including Palau digital IDs. Everyone on my announcement section was like hating on that. Like, there's no way. There's a that little thing. Digital sovereignty is the most incredible thing that anybody has ever invented. I'm just like the most big bull on it. So if anybody was doubting this thing, there you go. You, yeah, you can, I mean you can get like a Lithuania or a Estonia right? digital ID too, right? Like, and then you're part of like the EU and the Shenzhen like visa agreement. It's pretty great. That's <laughs> awesome. Like yeah. the thing is, it's not just like Palau. There's like um I think there's at least 10 countries at this point that are supporting digital sovereignty IDs. Yes. Absolutely. And a lot of it is for business purposes. People got to do business, right? So uh, a big question that I had on uh, on my announcement section was the fact that these nodes only had a runway of around like four years for that 15% total supply to kind of kick in. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we can go into that. A absolutely. So basically, we allot the 15%. 100% of that 15% is distributed in four years. So what happens afterwards? Well, the protocol takes 20% of all the service fee that's coming in, like whatever the gaming studios are paying, whatever the AI studios are paying to the compute, yeah, we take 20% and then we pay out 80%. In addition, the token subsidy rewards paid out to the compute providers, we take 5% of those tokens. Those token rewards being paid out, we take 5%, add that together with the service fee and that goes back into the Dow Treasury. Now on year three, a full year before the license technically token uh, allocation for it expires, We'll do a governance proposal and a vote. Oh. Anyone in the community will be able to vote. What should we do to refill the bucket allocated to checkers? Is it 5%? Is it 7%? Is it 10%? Is it 15%? So you're should already we... thinking about this. Like this is just going to continue. Yes. We have this all mapped out. And so it's kind of never ending. Like if we took in, say, a huge amount from the Dow Treasury and the network has grown a ton and like, there needs to be more checkers. Well, then maybe we need more budget. So maybe it's not 15%. Maybe it's 20% that's needed for the next four-year cycle. Either way, the entire community will have a chance to vote on it based on the network's needs. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So so your perspective is like, let's let the community decide after that 30-year mark what we're going to do instead of like just saying, oh, we're going to throw 30% of the supply over the next 10 years or something like that. Yeah, and it's self-balancing because like, if the network grows, then obviously yeah. token price goes up, then obviously it's a great incentive. Maybe that means more people want to participate at checkers or vice versa. If it goes down, maybe not as many people need to participate as checkers. Either way, we want to put this in the hands of our community to vote on like what do they think is most appropriate and how much of our treasury we should put back into uh, rewarding the checker uh, role. That makes sense. That makes sense. And, and for some of these like node operators, Igor is here is asking if uh, node ops is an investor or just a partner to run nodes. 
Yeah, so they invested. They purchased a bunch of nodes from us. So they're they're actually contributors. You got bags, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, bags. They're going to be rewarded for it. But yes, obviously, um, they purchased some nodes. So they're operating nodes in our ecosystem. They're contributing as a checker, and they're going to be a node as a service operator. Um, so you can see that their interests are fully aligned. No, it should be like that. Like I just bought a bunch of nodes, right? And I'm like, okay. Cause my, my thing has always been, uh, I'm not gonna name the projects, but they're like, there are a bunch of projects that are coming out with nodes. It's not like it's a new concept, right? But we're, we're pretty selective relatively. I mean, there's 50,000 coins that come out every single day. We do a node play like maybe like once every month or every two months. And the number one thing that I always look at is like, okay, we have a use case. People are actually gonna use this thing. It has a ton of backers. The people that are in this project are actually like investing into the thing. They're not just talking Fugazi off everything. So yeah. I've always thought that was really important. Something else I think is super important is like, can you like tell us maybe like who is going to use these Aether nodes? Like, is it just going to be everyone using Aether nodes? Do you already have someone in mind for Aether yeah. node usage? Great, great question. So we, we're actually the only project in the ecosystem that already has enterprise clients, right? Um, so All right. very different from other, uh, uh, other solutions in market, basically, um, we don't do consumer grade compute. We're like enterprise grade only. And that's because our customers are enterprise clients that have super, super high SLA requirements, right? Um, so we have the world's largest telco is already using our smartphone virtualization service. So basically creating- Who's that? It's like smartphone instances. So rather than like, you know how like the Saga is a Web3 phone, but it's a it's like a hardware phone, right? So uh, I don't know if you guys saw like a phone. A phone is basically just like, it's a cloud instance of a phone. So you could be using like a $20 phone, but you click this little icon, it instantly pops up a cloud instance and it's running like an iPhone, right? Really? So you have, all so you the have power- like a fucking fifty dollar flip phone running off an iPhone fifteen. Yes, and you can so get- I just bought this thing for nothing or what? Yeah, pretty much. No, I mean, not really. Don't say that <laughs> because <laughs> then you're relying on uh, your local hardware to run it. But basically, if you have a low end phone, you can access a super high end phone. What's even nice is you can essentially create mini ecosystems, right? Let's say. Bybit wanted to create their own ecosystem with their own wallet and apps and mantle and everything. And then just a little smartphone instance, you click it and it hops in. Let's say Binance wanted to create one. Let's say Solana wanted to create one, right? Every single ecosystem create can create their own instance with all their preloaded apps and everything. And there's no need to ever like download. You don't have to go through an app store. You don't have to pay a 30% fee to Google or Apple. You instantly have, yeah, yeah, right? Like all the content with no monetization share to the big publishers directly in that cloud instance. And yeah, world's largest telco already uses that for, you know, our service for that. We have- Like right now. Yes, already running. Dude, our- So without the checker nodes running or? Yes, it's all on a fiat basis right now. All on a fiat basis because we're pre-TGE. All of it's going to be moved on chain for TG, but right now, all on a fiat basis, no checker nodes, which is actually why it's super important for us to onboard the right compute partners, uh, because it's very dangerous. They could fall short of these SLAs. Um, but in addition to this, we have three of like top ten games in the world, right, by player base. Um, you know, I named one earlier. Uh, you know, I think you'll see several come out in the next couple months we'll be making lots of announcements right before tg right after the tg the pump token you know um but basically like yeah we have the largest game publishers and studios on board utilizing our service we've been quality control and testing for the last year year and a half with them it's not an easy onboarding process because it's like they're they're switching on a service for a, a live service right it's like switching out the engine when you're flying the plane and they have hundreds of millions of players and they're going to start offering a cloud instance, a cloud version to increase total addressable market so that players that have maybe lower end phones or can't choose or play the type of content they want can now instantly access any content they want. Regardless, That's really cool. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. So, so you're just that, onboarding everybody that has bad phones. It's not just bad phones. It's like 
it's like PC to mobile, right? Like, what if you built a PC version of a game and you don't have time or money as an indie dev to rescan, redevelop everything for a mobile version? Well, and also PC games look better. <laughs> also, PC games look better. You can just <laughs> you know? make, it a, make it a cloud instance, and then you can play it on the phone instantly. Zero development time. Instantly, you're ready to go, which is pretty crazy. Does this already exist? Like it does. It does. It's it actually does, super right? popular in like South Korea, Japan, China, parts of Southeast Asia. Cloud gaming is really popular. Okay. Um, actually, it's just us the- Westerners. Like we don't know it exists. <laughs> So uh, there, there's instance of this, but actually the best instance to look at is like Genshin Impact. I don't okay. know if you ever read Genshin Impact, but you know Genshin Impact is a PC game. It's a PC game. Yeah, and they also have a mobile game for it. But they stream it to mobile. So like in Asia, you play mobile through the cloud, the PC game. It's a 4K resolution game. Wait, actually, like every time I play Genshin Impact, that's from a PC streaming over here? Yes. Yeah, oh, it's pretty nuts. What? This is Since why, like, when? that's like years ago. Genshin Impact Cloud. Take a look at it. It's pretty nuts, and so that's why you have such high fidelity, even though it's a uh, Genshin Compact. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, that's why you have the mobile version. So you don't. They don't have to develop a whole new version. They can play Genshin Impact even if you're on a twenty dollar, I don't know, Galaxy S or Oppo, whatever, in Southeast Asia. You can still play high-end games. Right? Actually, another really good example is: uh, you only play play. Uh, do you play any like battle royales, PUBG, maybe? Nah, I'm a Fortnite maxi. You gotta crank oh, those nineties. Okay. <laughs> like, PUBG Mobile, pretty popular around the world, right? Like three, Just a little four. bit. Yeah. Um, some of the biggest like FPS markets, say Brazil. Do you know why they don't play it? What What do you What do you think they play? They play There's too much, too many people. Uh, no, it's they play Free Fire. It's the Garena. Uh, I don't want to say knockoff, but oh, like, I know, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that a lot in in like the uh, Indian markets like, too. They play a lot of Garena, yeah, India, Southeast Asia. Yeah, yeah. But that's because they can't play PUBG Mobile. They can't download it. It takes like eight or nine gigs of storage plus like a gig of RAM to even run, which is higher than the average smartphone spec in these countries. Really? So the vast vast majority of players can't even play it. So they play Free Fire. And, you know, Free Fire is what, like 190 million monthly active users? So there's 190 million players playing something because, well, they don't have the right hardware to play PUBG Mobile, which they would be playing if they could, right? Yeah. So, like, how big is Garena Free Fire, to just give people context? It's like it's like 180, 190 million monthly active players. Right. In like Brazil, Southeast Asia, India, etc. And the only yeah. reason that's the case is because they cannot download PUBG mobile. If you if you could play <laughs> both games, why would that's you play? crazy? That is right. crazy. I that mean, it's I, not in that large just because of that. I don't want to knock Garena or their publishing strategy. Um, they obviously fine tune graphics to be more appealing, maybe to like the Brazilian or you know Indian markets. Um, so definitely don't want to knock that. But it started. And it came out after PUBG Mobile, and it became it came out after it was obvious PUBG Mobile couldn't be downloaded by players in this region. People just couldn't play it. So if, if like you're a local content creator, why would you play PUBG Mobile or stream PUBG Mobile if none of your fans can play? None of your community can play. You would go play Free Fire, which everyone else can join you in, right? So that's why it became so dominant in these markets. But cloud changes all. I of that. never thought about that. So so all these. All these AAA games are going to struggle a lot to get player bases in third world countries and places where people don't have these gig RAM phones and all these different things. So cloud computing is fixing this. Yeah. Is this I mean, like the TLDR what we've gotten from this? Like you have found much. the magical solution? <laughs> so, sort of. If you just think of like, yeah, you know the movie, Ready Player One, right? Yeah. You know, throws on goggles. He's instantly in this metaverse. But what don't you see? You don't see him running around with a giant gaming PC rig on his back, right? You just see him with little goggles. But that's because everything's up in the cloud. There's no way you can be hardware dependent on the for the content you want to access. But right now we are. Right now hardware is tied to the content. If you don't have the Xbox console, if you don't have the PS4, if you don't have a nice gaming PC, you can't play the content you want to play because there's no options. The moment we move that to the cloud and we can solve the cost issue of moving it to the cloud, you now disassociate content choice 
from any hardware variable. Think about that. It's exactly that, what that's I'm like. Doing. I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense. Everything's moving to the cloud, right? But it, it's um, it, it feels like it's happening so fast. Like it's it, it's like everybody was sleeping for five years. They just woke up and boom, everything's in the cloud now. So and maybe maybe we're just sleeping on it. Um, so we got a question here from Best Football. Wonderful. Is there any plan for airdrop for node holder? And what about the gaming projects which are going to use the Aether services? Any plan to give some utilities for the community? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. Holder incentives for the checker nodes. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I I can't comment on this yet. Um, I can say we're obviously yeah. looking at maybe all options. Um, you know, we we want to reward our checker community, so we're considering all options. Uh, specifically, airdrop, no airdrop. Um, I can't release that information yet. But what I can commit to is we're working internally and with all of our partners to ensure that they drive value back first to our checkered node holders. So, yeah, that's all I can say for now. The rest I can't commit to. All right. Yeah, yeah, I can't comment on. All right. <laughs> okay. I think we all know what that means. So I, 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 for me, it's always been like that with the Gala ecosystem. With pretty much every ecosystem, there's always like little like if you partner with a game, they'd give like an NFT out to incentivize people to play the game. My ideal is like, yes, most people will be DGENs that buy these checker nodes just for the sake of ROI. But there are like the very few that are actually interested in gaming and want to check out these games. So they would be very appreciative of items within games. But this isn't just a gaming project. Like we're, we're a gaming channel and all. But yeah. right now we're kind of getting like there's a shadow here. And it's a big shadow because AI is like taken over. <laughs> Um, have you looked into some of these like other AI projects in the space right now? Like, are you talking with them right now? And like, Hey, we're going to help you run this Soro generator craziness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have, so it's interesting because so much of our existing client base use cases have been from the gaming industry. You know, there's 3.3 billion gamers. It's a super massive, more mature industry. But guess what? AI is coming up super fast. And so it's not fair. Most, one of the most interesting things is even though adoption isn't super high yet and monetization isn't really there, right? Like um, the industry is just not as big or not as good as monetizing folks for it already. Um, the interest is there. So we're getting constantly pinged about AI use cases. So, you know, folks that want to rent our GPUs for LLM training or folks that have actually super creative uh, use case you know how there's like these shopping channels on like TikTok and Lazada. Oh my god, the the ones that they're like throwing the products every five seconds yes. and they just sell millions you know, of dollars. There's, there, there's there's AI ones now where essentially it's an AI You're joking. Stream. Yes, AI virtual assistant, and you can be like, hey, do you have it in a size large? Do you have it in a blue? Do you have a hat to go with it? And they instantly virtually visualize exactly what you're asking for while responding to you. So that's the type of stuff we can do because we're like, cool, Creepy. on our GPUs, it's basically like a cloud gaming instance. You interact with it, you ask it something, it renders on the spot, processes through an LLM your inputs on the spot, and then spits it back out to you with you know almost no lag, almost no ping uh, interactiveness, which is super interesting because that's just going to be the next generation of like content. If you think about it, it's like like Ready Player One. Right, it's just a bunch of NPCs, and as you talk to it, everything is being rendered as it goes by an AI. It's not an actual person. It's not pre-written content. It's happening on the fly. That's crazy. So our Amazon shopping is just going to be like a little Chat GPT there, giving us <laughs> all the answers on. Hey, I want this a little bit bigger. Oh well, here's a recommended item or something like that. Like the Amazon picks, but it's just um, Ether picks. Yeah. You know, pretty <laughs> a much, little bit pretty different. Much. And there'll be an assistant there and you can ask it anything and it'll like it'll pretend to walk across the stream to that thing and be like oh it's right here oh it's right here blah 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 dude it's already happening we've seen some of the like the internal services for like companies that are coming to us and be like hey do you have compute that can support this in these regions right it's super interesting the type of stuff that's coming out that is awesome that is awesome i mean it's it's the next frontier i'm i'm really excited for it so we got a question here from Kareem saying nodes are currently not available on the website. So right now it's March 19th. I think that sales started, what was it, 10 a.m. UTC. So that's 
6 p.m. Eastern time or in my time zone. It was funny because I scheduled the stream at 12 because it was my other time zone at 12, yeah, but it's yeah. actually nine. Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're all over the place right now. I think it's like nighttime for you. So we're global, yes. global. No, Amazing. it's, you know, our, we, we only had a whitelist that started yesterday. The whitelist ended and now. Oh, uh, it's over. We're, yeah, we're basically prepping for our public sale tomorrow. Tomorrow's our public sale. Don't forget to use. Did you your- optimize the gas on that contract? Because <laughs> it's going to get uh, spicy. Dude, we are. So actually, one of the things that we did that's interesting is game theory. We opened okay. up all the all the tiers at once. So you don't have to buy starting from tier one. If you Wait, want like, to. If I wanted to, I could buy a tier six at the second it started. Yes. So you don't have to avoid all the competition for tier one. Interesting. So what's really interesting is like. We made it so like, cool, you can go to tier one and you're limited to max five nodes. Tier two is 10 nodes. Tier three is 15 nodes. Tier four, I think, is like 30 or 50 nodes. Basically, so like if you're botting, you can maybe win, but you can't win that big, right? So we wanted to make it as fair as possible. You need a bot that just hit every tier at the same time. Every tier multiple times because it's limited by wallet. But then we also did it so like, cool, we open up all the tiers at once. So like... Let's say you didn't want to get in a gas fee war and risk your transaction failing. And you didn't want to buy just five. You want to buy 50. Well, you can go straight to tier four and buy 50. Tier five, buy 50. You don't have to fight with everyone in tier one and then wait until it gets to tier four and then try and fight there. So it becomes way more equal and even for everyone participating and helps lower the potential wasted gas fee. That's so smart. I don't know. Like, why hasn't no, anybody else thought of this? It's always tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four, like one at a time. And then everybody's like fucking fighting over the gas fees and all these different things. And I've always so found the, it to be a very frustrating experience. So it was like our like our internal like kind of mathematicians uh, model this. It's basically like it's like fire doors. Like it's always dangerous because everyone funnels into one location and then that's when you get stuck. That's when gas fee happens, congestion happens. Yeah. What we didn't want was that. We wanted folks to be able to self-select. Hey, you want you want to buy in size? Great. You can you can try and get the lowest pricing, but then you have gas fee wars, et cetera, et cetera. Or you want to buy in size and you want the ease and you want no risk. You want to secure something right away. Well, price yourself up a little bit and then there's no wait. It's just super speed checkout, right? So everyone can kind of do what's right for them. Obviously, a lot of folks are going to fight for that coveted tier one. Um, But if you want to, you know, you can navigate to tier four, tier five. (laughs) I mean, if you're going for anything less than like tier five or six, like you're throwing because there's there's too few of them, too few of them. It's going to be a war. That's kind of cool. So people probably have like spreadsheets on probabilities of getting nodes at a specific time. It's, it's insane. We have, we've actually turned away several VCs on the whitelist side and they straight up told us, they're like, yeah, okay, fine. We're just going to build a bot. We're going <laughs> to, we're deploying Makes this sense. month. We're going to build a bot and we're like, please don't do that. <laughs> it's not very nice. Um, yeah. It's going to be a little bit of a battle, a little uh, bloodshed there, but um, you know. That's what makes it fun, right? <laughs> Sort of. Yeah, I guess so. We try to make it as fair as possible so everyone can participate. Damn, okay. And and this starts tomorrow, 10 in the morning UTC. So March 20th, 10 in the morning UTC. The war starts. It's it's gonna be three in the morning for me. I'll I'll try to pick up an extra note or two, but it's it's gonna be a battle. Like that one's gonna be hard. It's it's on Arbitrum. So this is on W ETH Arbitrum. Why are we on Arbitrum? Because I know Zai launched their nodes on Arb. Now you're launching your nodes on Arb. Do you feel like the Arb space is too congested? There's too many projects building on there? Or is it like we just wanted to launch the NFTs there, but we're doing something else elsewhere? Uh, so for now, everything is deployed on Arb. Um, you know, we we work closely with the Arbitrum team off Chain okay. Lab. Um, you know, we're obviously exploring all potential chains, um, you know, as deep in and as live service, it's pretty risky um, to have downtime because, you know, you don't want to like kick people off Fortnite, right? In the middle of a game. No, then no. You, you know, you're going to get a bunch of people. Last raging. thing you want to do is upset a gamer. Exactly. Right. And so, you know, it never, you never want it to be infrastructure fault. Um, and that's one of the things about infrastructure is like, it's not very sexy. It's kind of boring. You never ask yourself, what Wi-Fi am I using? What, TCP IP address am I going to for this website? 
what 4G or 5G connection am I using, right? But the moment it doesn't work, then you care. And then you're super pissed, right? And that's kind of like what it is for us. It's like when it's working, nobody really needs to know that we're there. It just works. We're like a game server. No one's like, oh, I'm, I'm running on AWS. I'm, ru- I'm playing this game on Google Cloud. But if it goes down, then it's a huge issue. Um, but because of that, we had to optimize for what we felt uh, at that time is the best ecosystem and chain that can give us the best stability at the balance of cost price. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and so this token, Aether, right? Um, you have uh, an interesting ticker symbol. It's ATH. Yes. All time highs. Is that what you're going for? The meme coin rally? Nah, nah, no way, no way. No, yeah, you're too, so, you're too enterprise grade to care about that. It, it, it's it's Aether, right? A T H. Um, yeah, so, Aether. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. You know, we definitely, um, again, didn't mean to do that, but it's just Aether. Like it's the first three letters. So we're like, all right, cool. We'll just go with A T H. And, you know, we do want to see all-time highs, so, you know. <laughs> of course, uh, as a co-founder, obviously. So use cases on this token specifically. We've, we've learned about nodes, why they're important, why people should grab them, which they should also be using code JM for 10% off. But now that we've gotten this out of the way, token, win token. Yeah. So, uh, you know, knock on wood, uh, we've had conversations with several of the larger centralized exchanges. Um, we're getting a mid to end of May TGE, uh, but obviously dates are still final dates are still unconfirmed because we're two months out. Um, but basically we got confirmation that we should be go sometime in that time frame. Uh, okay. Time so frame. people buy the nodes right now, they just get nothing for two months or. Yeah. So they get, uh, when they purchase the node now, we are actually distributing all the licenses that, uh, are purchased in the first two weeks. Okay. are distributed on the third week. And then it's every two week cycle after that we distribute on the third week. Um, a month from now, our uh, checker software is ready for people to download and start participating in testnet. Um, and then it, the actual checker node uh, goes live at TG on mainnet. And that's when the former formal earnings starts. Uh, okay. But because we know there's this like kind of two month lag before we TGE, um, we're actually shortening the lockup required for the tokens by two months so that people get some of their liquidity and tokens back out a little bit sooner. And and could you tell us about that lockup a little bit more for tokens? Yeah. Um, so basically right now when you earn a token and you claim a token, you choose your lockup period. The default lockup period is 180 days, six months with no penalty. You can choose a shortened lockup period, which is 30 days, but then you'll have a 75% penalty. So we borrowed a lot of inspiration from like how Zai designed it. Um, so similar mechanism, you claim, you choose your lockup period, uh, but because we know we're uh, launching like two months after the checker node sale, we're shortening the lockup period to for four months to start with so that people essentially uh, get tokens back out uh, after six months from purchase. Yeah. Okay. Um, and when people grab these tokens, right, do they have to press claim every single day or is it just automatic? Uh, you can claim whenever you want, but you have to physically go and sign and claim. Okay. Same thing. If you delegate to folks, uh, you, whoever you delegate to say, say it's Animoca, it's up to you when to claim and how much to claim at a time. And then also the choose the vest, like the lockup period, right? Okay, and that and that's like that's the, across the board with like Zai and how they do it too. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so same. it's not like it's foreign. All right, everybody knows it works already. Got same. it. Good. Yeah, yeah, that's what I wanted to make sure. Good. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> All right. Awesome. And and so this token, like, um, what are people using it for primarily? Yeah. So the token is the single currency and medium of exchange mm-hmm. uh, in our network. So if you want to buy compute. Um, you're an AI startup trying to do these AI virtual assistants. Well, then you need to purchase our token and then you need to pay for your services in a gas fee manner for all the rendering cost on our network. So for every 15 minutes of rendering service is basically how we charge it. We call it an epoch. Every epoch, you pay a certain amount of gas fee in our ATH token to the network for these compute services. And then 
this uh, service fee that they pay is then split up 80% out to the compute provider and then 20% back to the Dow Treasury, which then goes to recycle rewards for the checkers. And is it, are you guys trying to do something like GeForce Now where you're just going to release cloud computing for the masses too after the enterprises? Is that the idea? So, right now, we're trying to make it so that uh, the general public never needs to pay for anything. Right, like we don't we don't want to monetize end users. That's actually we th something we think that most traditional cloud services did, did wrong. Like GeForce Now, Google Stadia, it's all like 15, 20 bucks a month or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Right. But why charge the end user when they're the ones accessing some games content and then monetizing in that content? Shouldn't the studio pay for their access? If you like if you want to monetize a player you should pay for their access to come be monetized, right? So that, that's kind of what we believe. Now, this model works very, very well so far in Asia. Generally, the West has higher dis discretionary income, uh, so they're willing to pay for these services. But again, the overall service never really took off, which is why you know, Google Stadia failed or was shut down. Because you, when you try and monetize the end user, the actual adoption is just very, very low. There's actually not that many people that can or are willing to pay an extra 15 to 20 bucks a month for a cloud solution. And if they can, if they are willing, generally they don't need it. Because <laughs> they're like, like if, if you can afford a computer, like, yeah, like if you can afford an extra 20 bucks a month, I mean, maybe like you can't get the best computer, but generally you can get something. If you can have enough disposable income to also pay an extra 20 bucks a month for a cloud version of the service, right? Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. All right. The the rich are the ones paying it. That's good. That's good. Drop me the referral code. Hell yeah. It's J um. Yeah, boys. So it's gonna be tomorrow. I'm really hyped for it. I mean, I've already got nodes. The A3 team was kind enough to go ahead and give me some. We also gave out, I gave away, I think like 70% of all of them to to Legion. It's our Discord link in the description. We're just killing it on every node cell, Dan. I don't know if you knew this. Like we're just That's killing awesome. it right now, and I'm just excited to be a part of the forefront of all of this. It's like you you have all these like DeFi creators and all these like DeFi influencers, and we're just like screw that. We're just on gaming, 100% gaming. We might not be as big, but we are. We sure as hell are fucking mighty. So it, it's an exciting time, Dan. That's essentially everything I have for you. We have maybe have like one more question, then we'll leave you here because I know we're strapped on time. So mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from the boys saying the max supply is more than total supply. What what is that? Uh, what does that mean? I have no idea. Uh, no, the I don't think it is. I don't think it is. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Our max supply is our total supply. <laughs> yeah, that that would make sense. Yeah, and um, and that's gonna be released over God knows what vesting with God knows what like crazy numbers and tokenomics, and that's too complicated for a, a simple live stream for us. But I hope I answered everybody's questions. Everybody seems to be happy with the the resolution of it all. Dan, thank you for hopping on the channel co-founder of something that's launching tomorrow must be really busy today but yes, uh, it sure was uh, a pleasure having you yeah thank you so much for having me i'm super honored by all the support that you've given us um really excited by all the community that turned out please please if you want to contribute in the ecosystem you can sneak in at the earliest earliest pricing and tiers don't forget to use jm for your code you get a 10 percent rebate uh, I will see you guys at the public sale tomorrow. You 10 a.m. UTC. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs> All right, I'll see y'all later. Stay classy. Bye -bye. See ya. Peace.